morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, wherever you are in Turkey, Europe, United States, Asia. Uh, welcome to this very important and timely event, uh, part of the um, part of our EU Engage series on on um, areas that affect the European Union its foreign policy, its security policy. We have one hour. It's, it's very short, particularly since it's about Turkey and now a post-election Turkey, if indeed anything will change. And we have a, a stellar lineup, and I'm delighted to have um, in in this order um, Zenim Aydin Duzgit from Tambachi University in Turkey. Great to have you. Thank you very much. And we have Ambiran Zaman, a very good, excellent com correspondent, as most of you know, from Al Monitor. And we have Mark, Carin uh, Mark Perini, um, how would you? I was going to say um, the uh, not the godfather of Turkish politics, but uh, a great Turkish expert and a mentor to us all at Carnegie Europe and all the colleagues who deal with Turkey. So a, a very warm welcome to you all. And without further ado, we're going to uh, kick off with uh, Senem. Senem, you have um, you're saddled with uh, giving us um, about eight or nine minutes overview if it's possible at all, on the political consequences of this election. Will it be more nationalist? Will it be more conservative? What's your, what's your feeling of the, of the next five years, if it's, if it's at all possible to, to consider? Okay. Thank you very much, Judy. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here at this event. Um, well, uh, it's going to be a difficult five years, I think. Let's start with that. I mean, of course, it's very hard to speculate uh, as to where and how things will go. But as it stands, let me just tell you that we are facing a very conservative and nationalist parliament. Um, and the ruling bloc uh, with Erdogan and around him is a rather nationalist and conservative ruling bloc. Um, and they are going to have the power to rule for the next five years if nothing extraordinary happens. I'm not expecting, to be honest, early elections or anything of the sort, uh, unless some people uh, say so, but I don't agree with that. Um, in terms of what this means for governance in Turkey, well, I mean, if we start with domestic politics, I'm not expecting a radical change. Um, in Turkish domestic policy. That is, by radical change, I'm not expecting a normalization in the sense of returning to democracy. Um, I think we are going to have more of the same, uh, at least I suspect. Of course, I would be extremely positively surprised if that changes, but um, I don't expect that to change. And the reason for that is that I read lenses, um, and you know, the, my analytical lenses of reading, interpreting Turkish uh, domestic and foreign policy is the concept of regime security. I mean, academically, I, I write a lot on this issue as well. That is, when you look at Turkey's policies from the lens of regime security, then you do kind of have a sense of where things might go domestically and foreign policy wise. And I think the current set of consolations of the governing regime um, means that, um, you know, I don't think, you know, returning to a normalized, a more decentralized, a more democratic form of rule is not very much foreseeable um, for, for the immediate future. So that would be my take on domestic politics. I know that now we have, um, you know, the new ministers announced, I think it was yesterday, uh, they announced new names and it's, you know, some people have taken it as proof that Turkey might be moderating a little bit, you know, at least we have, we seem to have a more sensible person in charge of the economy. Um, yes, uh, that might be some silver lining, but I would still be cautious in interpreting that um, as a positive support, in, as a positive sign in the direction of good governance, as we know that it's very much in the hands of the president and his sort of close ruling circle. And they're the ones that really, you know, make the key important decisions. So the ministers of the parliament, et cetera, they're all of minor, minor, you know, importance in this whole power of constellation. So that's what sort of makes me a little bit, I would say, uh, doubtful of such claims that, you know, this, this is quite a rather an optimistic um, set of ministers. Of course, it could have been worse. 
right? <laughs> um, it could have, we've had much worse ministers for economy, the previous one, of course, with standing. Uh, so at least this seems like, you know, at least a bit of a better step in the right direction, you know, from an economic point of view. I'm, I'm not talking about other issues like social policy, etc. you know, letting alone those ministers. Um, but of course, it remains to be seen whether they will be allowed to undertake mm. the right economic steps um, or for how long, because we have local elections coming up in about nine months. And my fear is that this might just be a sign to the urban electorate that this party is normalizing, especially on economic and financial accounts, because the recent elections have shown that the government party, governing party is losing in big cities. So this might just be a sign for the urban electorate saying that they are on the path to recovery and reform. So perhaps help them to tilt the balance in their favor in the in nine months of time to come. So in other words, I'm not sure that even those signs of normalization, at least on the economic front, uh, would be durable, would be there to stay. Um, if I have a few more minutes, you know, maybe I'd, I could also say a few things about what this means for foreign policy. Now, I know that Mark Pierini will get into that probably as well, and perhaps Sambir and Zaman too. But again, for my notion of regime security, what I see is that, okay, if we try to interpret or understand where Turkish foreign policy might go from here, again, those lenses of regime security are useful because. Erdogan's victory comes at a time, again, uh, of crisis of the liberal order, right? So this crisis is here to come, and it doesn't look like it's going anywhere too soon. Uh, and it is this context in which Erdogan can maneuver his way through um, different powers, um, you know, not just politically, but also financially, economically as well. So I would expect Turkey to continue playing this so-called mediator role between Russia and the West. Turkey, you know, being the gatekeeper of migration at the EU's borders. Um, and of course, an economic and financial hub, say, for the 21st century autocrats of the world, right? And of course, um, on top of these, the techno-nationalist rhetoric, which was also, which proved useful in Erdogan's victory in the elections as well. I would expect that to continue and bolstered further by the conflicts in Turkey's wider neighborhood, in which Turkey is also mm -hmm. involved in. Um, and so it will once again, you know, have the option of hedging between multiple partners to secure uh, this, 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 this government and the regime's survival. So that is how I see, that's how I um, interpret where Turkey might go uh, from here. But of course, we can get into more sort of micro level topics, mm -hmm. other subjects in case you're interested mm -hmm. or in case there are questions. Of, of course, thank you very much, Senem, for giving us this, uh, not what you call an overly optimistic uh, view of the situation. And even if, if um, Erdogan has this so-called um, liberal or pragmatic economist. Uh, frankly, as you say, he can dislodge them or just reassure the foreign investors or whatever. But um, it's maybe it's a fig leaf, but it's it won't change fundamentally. Which brings me to uh, Amberin. Um, Amberin, um, Sin mentioned the the crisis of the liberal order, but I mean, what's happening in this? big, important country, the whole repression and the disregard for human rights of the rule of law, of an independent media, um, and a kind of polarization that those who really do want um, a consolidation of democracy. I just wonder how, how the human rights situation will, will improve or will it remain the same? And if indeed um, there's any influences that can actually improve the situation there. Thank you for participating in this. Well, thank you very much for having me. I agree very much with everything that Senem said. And she already mentioned that she didn't believe that the human rights situation would improve uh, anytime soon. And I think a very early marker of that was the fact that one of the members of parliament from who was elected on the uh, Turkish uh, Workers' Party, this small left-wing party ticket, a uh, very prominent human rights defender, 
uh, who is in jail was not able to claim his seat in the parliament. If you know we have this new magnanimous Erdogan before us, well, clearly it would have been a very good way of signaling that you know things are changing, the repression is easing. Uh, I absolutely don't believe that is on the cards anytime soon. Um, as for you know the, the the argument that he has this new cabinet, well, there's a bit of castling going on here. Hakan Fidan, the new uh, foreign minister, has already already had a big hand in foreign affairs, as you know, and this was very uh, much linked to uh, some very dark things that Turkey's been doing uh, abroad with these illegal renditions of the regime's opponents, people getting kidnapped, uh, rendered, and then held at black sites inside Turkey. This, this has been documented. And the war against, of course, uh, the US-backed uh, Kurdish-led administration in northeast Syria, where, uh, you know, there's just a constant stream of attacks against uh, that uh, administration, you know, under the guise of uh, attacking the PKK, the Kurdistan Workers' Party, which Turkey insists is very closely linked to that administration. And the effects I just returned from Syria are pretty devastating because not only do they kill these alleged terrorists, um, and, you know, some of them were linked, are linked to the PKK for sure, um, a lot of civilians are getting killed, children are getting killed. Uh, same goes for Iraqi Kurdistan, where Turkey is, you know, uh, waging war against the PKK there, again, affecting the civilian population. And uh, Hakan Fidan was in control of both of those files, not to mention, of course, in Syria, there are all these jihadi groups that are Turkey's, um, you know, patrons, very much rely on Turkey that... Um, uh, you know, <laughs> they've committed war crimes, in fact, and this has been documented by the United Nations. Um, so it's a bit hard, obviously, to be uh, optimistic mm. things will change, as I said, on that front. And insofar as the leverage that the European Union can bring to bear, well, it's, <laughs> you know, the relationship is so nakedly, uh, so cynically transactional, mm -hmm. where Turkey is the gatekeeper, uh, the holding pen for all these uh, Syrian and other uh, refugees. And, of course, for Europe, that's of critical importance that none of those people make it to Europe. And by the same token, of course, the Turkish economy being as bad as it is, as weak as it is, uh, coupled with the uh, repression. I mean, surely there's a big worry in Europe that not only will you be seeing more of these Syrian refugees, but also Turkish, Kurdish uh, refugees. So it's very much in Europe's interest to keep Turkey stable, as it were. Um, so, of course, we didn't really mention the Kurdish issue more broadly, but, you know, when we look at this election result where we all talk about um, nationalism winning, uh, extreme right-wing nationalism. Uh, I think it rests on two pillars. It rests on, first of all, um, the sort of paranoia that's been created around the Kurdish issue that the uh, government has been leveraging to the max. Um, and on the other hand, of course, this very deep resentment, uh, racist, I would say at this point, unfortunately, that is felt towards all these refugees. And um, I see nothing, uh, certainly the government that shows no signs of wanting mm -hmm. to address the Kurdish issue in any kind of meaningful way. Uh, and of course, those refugees are not going anywhere, even though both the opposition and the government has pledged to send them home. Thank, Thank you, Amber, and for this. Um... Yes, another bleak presentation. Um, it is it is very depressing the transactional um, diplomacy, for want of a better term, um, and the cynicism also, which I'm sure um, Mark Perini will bring in. Mark has been looking at the EU NATO relationship with Turkey for a very long time now, and Mark, if you would like to sort of um, build on what Sainam and uh, Amberin um, discussed um, about Turkey's future, which is, which is really very depressing. Does the EU or NATO have any leverage? They call themselves, you know, organizations of values and democracy and, 
and other uh, so-called human rights issues. Um, do we have any leverage now over Turkey? Thank you well, for joining us. Thank, thank you, Judy. Uh, I don't know if I will bring more cynicism, but uh, the situation is not bright, of course. Uh, first of all, before making any comment, we have to understand how this election has been seen from Brussels, from the EU, from NATO. Uh, well, it has been seen very simply as not free, not fair, period. Why? To bring it down to the essentials. One, the election law was changed beforehand in order to salvage the nationalist ally of the AKP. That's one. Two, the main contender from the opposition parties, Imam Olu, the mayor of Istanbul, has a trial on his head and he was in the appeal process. Therefore, he was prevented from running and will be prevented from running for the Istanbul mayorship next year. Okay. And the third element is that you have a higher election council, which is supposed to be the guardian of a fair election. And its president, on the eve of the first round, clearly admitted, answering a question from a journalist, that, well, the election council is not accessible to candidates, but he still gives privileged information to the president. This is what you have. And now, of course, the narrative we hear from the presidential cabinet is that this was a model of democracy. No, it wasn't. And, and therefore, the prevailing uh, impression here is that, yes, we are uh, an entity of values at the EU, but we cannot impose democracy on a country where the dominant regime, dominant in the sense of so many instruments in their hands, has chosen autocracy, period. Uh, we cannot impose that from outside. Now, what we have in front of us is a more presidential regime than it already was. The uh, names we've heard from the, for the presidential cabinet are basically senior bureaucrats, uh, people who have been at the order of the president recently or in a distant past. Uh, so we'll see what we, that will give. Um, a lot of attention here in Brussels and perhaps one of the, the hopeful uh, areas is the appointment of Mehmet Simsek as economy and treasury minister. Fine. But that is wait and see because uh, he uh, has been appointed. He's a reasonable man. I know him well. Um, he is welcome as a name by the financial circles in London, in New York, and so on. But whether he will be able, whether he will have the liberty to take the measures to reinvigorate the economy or to let it collapse, that we don't know yet. So we'll see. Uh, then on uh, the foreign policy front, we mm. have Fidan, uh, recently uh, and for a long time head of the intelligence service. In my time, uh, a, a collaborator of Erdogan as prime minister. That's how I knew him. And, and we have uh, probably Cullen as the head of intelligence now. Essentially, what you have here are loyal president keep, uh, keeping implementing his foreign policy. So it is the same presidential regime. What are the priorities of this regime? Uh, essentially, I would characterize it as Turkey's political and military autonomy. Okay, this is uh, uh, expressed now through the reinforcement of the military industry with many new devices going up uh, to, to, into the inventory of the army. Uh, and it's also expressed with the so-called balance policy between Russia and NATO, which essentially has led to Russia's uh, having an advantage over NATO, but that can be discussed. So for the EU, the other uh, small glimmer of hope is that, but I'm, as I'm saying glimmer, not hope, glimmer of hope, um, is the message that the president gave about reconciliation with society. Well, if that is true, that is true, uh, let's see if Libertas will be freed, Kavala will be freed, if their uh, trials will be closed in a decent manner and according uh, to uh, the opinion of the uh, European Court of Human Rights or not. If that doesn't happen, 
don't expect much because whatever the uh, senior officials in the European Commission will want to do, uh, they will have, or politicians in the European Council, they'll have the European Parliament on the way. The issue here is not to have a fight with uh, the re-elected president of Turkey at all. Uh, the issue is not to uh, deny the importance of uh, Turkey as, as a strategic partner. The issue is not to be influenced by uh, the way in which uh, democracy, quote unquote, mm -hmm. is implemented in Turkey. Uh, we have seen, even on the night of the inauguration, uh, we have seen very harsh words against, well, the European press, for example, the Economist, Le Point, L'Express, and so on. Uh, we've seen, seen very harsh words about some communities, LGBT and, and others. So, you know, these things will not sell well, uh, to say the least, in, in Europe. So mm. we'll see what happens. And then uh, don't expect any move on the accession process because the accession process is like death without the funerals. So that <laughs> is not... Uh, revivable at this point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Voila. Oh, voila, indeed. Uh, Mark, we will we'll have to go back to NATO as well and mm -hmm. some other issues uh, about delivery of, of uh, missiles and, and, and other things. Um, I want to ask, um, the, thank you very much to the three of you for giving this, this overview, but I, I want to ask um, a, a question really about it goes back to the ability of, of whether it's the European Union or whether it's the United States. Um, uh, deep down, um, you wonder, are the Europe is the EU more comfortable with this status quo rather than changing direction in the sense that really op uh, openly supporting civil society and having a really serious discussion about the refugees as well? And, and when we look at the whole human rights record, the issue of the Kurdish um, situation, what's happening to the return of refugees under the so-called rehabilitation of Assad, and it's awful when they do return, you wonder, is the, is the EU and NATO to a lesser degree actually willing to actually change direction in terms of the leverage, in terms of, of, of trying to protect what's left of human rights there. I would like uh, any of you to jump in on, on this issue of more comfortable with the status quo rather than actually seriously addressing the human rights issue. Shall I go first? Shall we go and Please, please, please do. Please, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you, Judy. Um, well, I'm afraid I don't think I can say very optimistic words here as well because my feeling um, is that especially you know in the process that we had in, you know in the run-up to the elections was a big anxiety on the part of uh, some of the European actors as to what would happen if if the opposition actually won I mean I could sense that anxiety from the interview requests I got or from the questions that were raised so I could feel it all along in Brussels when I was speaking to my colleagues um so I, it it sort of hurts also on a personal level that there was this anxiety I mean of course some of it can be understood because nobody was prepared for an opposition win and somehow all the polls were suggesting that the opposition had a reasonable chance but also some of that anxiety had to do with two things. One of course was what would happen with the migration deal because the opposition leader had stated that they were going to annul the deal or renegotiate it or whatever. And of course that was, as we all know, that is a major you know, cause of concern in EU capitals when the far right capitalizes a lot so much on this issue. And secondly, the fear that Turkey you know, governed by the opposition, would want to revitalize the accession process, which mm -hmm. is now perceived impossible, given also the Ukrainian accession prospect, which also is a big unresolvable issue out there. Um, so I think it was because of these two issues that my hunch, and I don't want to be fair to, uh, I, I, I don't want to be unfair to all of our European, uh, you know, colleagues and stakeholders here, because we know that there are those groups that fundamentally disagree with this point of thinking, or this line of thinking. But I would say that the key stakeholders, 
um, in the capitals that are currently uh, governing Europe, uh, I would say most of them, or a majority of them, um, are quite comfortable with an Erdogan win. At least I, my sense is that they can, for they feel like they can afford a transactional relationship, as long as Turkey sort of toes the line between Russia and the West carefully, and it doesn't slide too much in one way or the other, um, as long as the migration deal continues, and as long as it doesn't turn to a democracy so that there is, you know, they don't, that Europe doesn't have to worry about uh, revitalizing Turkey's accession talks or the customs union or anything of that sort. So in my opinion, it creates a comfort zone. Ooh. Uh, Amber, and um, this, this comfort zone, this uh, better to deal with the status quo than dealing with something unpredictable. But we're talking about uh, the fabric of a society. We're talking about the whole structure of the institutions being changed, being downgraded. And I was wondering, when you look at this situation in Turkey, does it give a kind of solace or hope to other authoritarian regimes that, oh, yes, they can actually uh, ride home in victory again. I mean, is this um, is this um, a, a kind of a signal for other regimes that actually the West is pretty powerless? They don't have the leverage, and they're not going to exercise leverage. So we can we can remain where we are, comfortable in in our new status quo. I'd first like to caveat what um, you just said. Uh, because let's not forget about the Eastern Mediterranean and the Cyprus issue and the Aegean issue. And I recall very vividly just a few years ago when Turkey was being extremely sort of hawkish aggressive over those issues and the drill ships going and coming. And it, it was a very fraught time. And I think the Europeans were very concerned. Of course, uh, Mark can speak to that uh, better than I can. Um, at the same time, again, I would repeat that an unstable Turkey is bad for Europe too. And if this government persists in these policies, persists in this trajectory, I think that, you know, it, things could get pretty bad. And let's also not forget that there's always, always the risk that the, you know, the PKK decides that since it's not really gotten anything out of uh its ceasefire, uh, the fact that the Kurdish political movement uh, has been, you know, criminalized in this way, it leaves no other avenue other than for the PKK to resort to violence once again. I'm, I'm not suggesting that that's what they'll do immediately, but, you know, they may eventually think that, well, that's the only way we can sort of gain leverage again. And what would they then do? They would start attacking tourist um, sites. They would go after, you know, places like Bodrum and Marmaris, as they've done in the past. And and again, that would be a, a bad thing for everybody. Obviously, for, for the victims, but for Turkey, for Europe. So, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, with regard to your question about uh, autocrats worldwide, you know, uh, gaining succor from what's happened in Turkey, um, obviously, but even before that happened, what we just saw in Saudi Arabia with President Biden going and, you know, basically kissing um, Mohammed bin Salman's ring after saying he would be a pariah. I think, you know, it, it, it's just not Turkey. It's, it, there's so many other examples out there of that. And I think principally um, from the Arab state's point of view, it's very reassuring, of course, to have to, to have seen Erdogan do this U-turn, because I have always argued, and it may seem like a stretch, but that the Arab Spring actually started in Turkey when Recep Tayyip Erdogan embarked on these dizzying reforms that shamed the European Union into opening accession talks, when he stood up to the military, to military tutelage, when Turkey was projecting soft power, was an economic, you know, people, economists would take issue with the argument, but at least uh, it seemed to be really doing very well economically as well. And you saw a country where everybody, Kurds, pious people, LGBT people, everybody felt kind of comfortable uh, for a while. And I think that was hugely inspiring to people across the Middle East. So um, to see Erdogan become one of them again, obviously is, you know, <laughs> reassuring. Mm -hmm. I, I never, I never um, 
looked at it in that aspect. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that insight, Amber. Um, it's very important. Mark, uh, Amber and uh, Zinem um, have described actually, uh, it, yes, it's sort of stable, but isn't, isn't this kind of, um, for want of a better term, this kind of system that Erdogan has built, doesn't it breed the seeds of its own instability? Well, if we speak of the reactions of uh, European leaders, not taking into account uh, Viktor Orban, of course, with, with a special case, but all the others, uh, well, we, we have seen uh, many uh, congratulations because simply, um, you know, this is an election that uh, uh, Europeans had nothing to do with, no influence. Um, and yes, there is, to some extent, uh, the uh, application of this long-standing uh, uh, foreign policy uh, idea that uh, better the devil you know that than the one you, you don't. Well, fine. Uh, but the problem is the consistency of the policy that we have in front of us. Uh, essentially, if you look at uh, just one example, uh, look at the regions where uh, Kilis Darulu came first in the second round. Essentially, it's the coastal ring, uh, the coastal belt from uh, Istanbul to Adana and, and Ankara. Well, these regions are representing two thirds of Turkey's GDP. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so, what you have is, is a dynamic inside Turkey where uh, the president is still supported by the regions uh, where he was strong before, um, but uh, he's lost uh, numbers. He's not happy about that, and he said it. Um, and, and, and the urban regions uh, are the ones, uh, you know, looking for modernization, looking for justice, looking for free media and so on, because they know they need that to survive and to uh, develop their links with Europe. Mm -hmm. In effect, what, what you have is a, is, a fact, is a fight between an autocratic system, which is there, uh, which has benefited a number of people, obviously, and, and the other fact, which is that other than steroids or, or short-term cash injections from the Gulf and Russia, what you have is an unescapable link in, term of, in terms of investment, technology, innovation with Europe. So that will have to uh, uh, be developed. That's the role of Shimshek, probably. But the problem is that if with the tens of thousands of uh, European businesses that have invested money in Turkey, the big ones like uh, uh, you know, Siemens, uh, Bosch, and Renault, and Fiat, and Ford, and so on, all the small and medium-sized enterprises. If these people are there to stay and others to come, what you need is a level playing field. You mm -hmm. need more independent judiciary, you need mm -hmm. free media, and you need an appease atmosphere. And that link has not ever been made within mm -hmm. the governing circle. Mark, um, I want to I want to go back to this whole idea of, of um, the, uh, the the instability that may be lurking. Um, Mark, you've, I want to just uh, go back to the thing we really didn't discuss, which is NATO, uh, which is everybody says, well, NATO will not take on Turkey uh, in the sense of challenging what's going to happen. It's a geostrategic area. It's very important. Uh, not only for the region, but we have the situation now, Turkey, it, this ambiguous situation with regard to Ukraine, its relations with Russia, its relations with Iran, and this is an, a, a major NATO member. Um, what's the thinking inside NATO over this uh, future relationship with Turkey? Very well, briefly, uh, before we open it up. Yeah, uh, clearly uh, Turkey is an important uh, NATO member. Very often people say it's the second largest army. It's not true because this is ca not counting the nuclear aspects, but never mind. Uh, it is an army which is reinforcing with new equipment, very powerful equipment coming on, on stream in the next few years. Uh, the problem is the assessment that Turkey will make uh, of the war in Ukraine. So far, balanced policy. Okay, but... In the assessment, they need to take into account the fact that 
One this is not just because it is a Russian war on Ukraine. It's a war on European territory, and this is the absolute priority of the European Council. This war is there to last, it's there mm -hmm. to increase, to deteriorate, and and we'll have uh, in a foreseeable future uh, hybrid attacks of Russia on EU members, uh, on the North Sea okay. or whatever, and mm -hmm. it's already happened. Uh, so what will Turkey do if this situation deteriorates to the point that um, uh, European countries are under threat? Can Turkey remain outside? I don't think they will be able to remain outside. But of course, at the moment, what you see, including on the issue of uh, Swedish succession, is a sort of uh, backstage uh, discussion to keep uh, Turkey on board as, as much as we can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is very difficult and uh, cynical as well, but it's, it's, it's real politic as well. But I, I'm still... I'm still when you when you look at the map, when you look at what's happening uh, in Russia, when you look at what's happening inside the EU, for instance, in Poland and Hungary. Um, do, do any of you have um, a clear idea what Erdogan wants to do with Turkey? We mentioned the modernization. We mentioned you know not big hopes for the economy, um, but what sort of what sort of country or society? Does he want to continue to build in in his new five year tenure? No, well, my quick answer to this is consolidate autocracy. Uh, as simple as that. Uh, then uh, there is a, a sort of obligatory step to be taken, which is now uh, revamping the economy, uh, developing the links with Western Europe on the economic front. Needless to say. They probably want to do that at the expense of human rights, and that will not work well with not only European politicians, but also mm -hmm. European businesses. Remember one thing, which I keep repeating in each and every meeting, when two years and two and a half years ago, Volkswagen canceled a 1.3 billion euro investment, and this was Volkswagen, one of the major, major groups, automotive groups in Europe. This was for reasons linked to the troops in Syria and yeah. human rights. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mark, for this. Uh, just to whoever listening out there, whether it's morning, evening, or nighttime, or afternoon, don't hesitate to, to use the, the chat device to send in any questions or comments. We'd be delighted to, to, to host um, any, any kind of conversations. Um, I'm still, I, I'm actually still um, not so much puzzled, but perplexed by, by this situation where we have this uh, continuing degradation of the, uh, the liberal order. It's a bit glib, this term. But I, I want to go back to this question, this, this, um, this element of, of stability, or the status quo, which the EU and NATO really um, deal with when it comes to Turkey. But actually, on the other hand, and we've seen this in other countries, and it will happen in Russia sooner or later, autocracy do breed the seeds of instability. Will we see, and um, I think it was, uh, Amber, you mentioned the Kurdish issue, or maybe Senem as well, that maybe they've nothing to gain now, and maybe they will actually um, go, go, go on the offensive. But is there, is there any way of, of breaking out of this kind of uh, autocracy? Well, I mean, Senem, I'm, so, I'm so sorry. Uh, I just want to just make a very quick... No, go ahead, please, Amir, I, I can come you in know, later. You asked uh, what kind of Turkey want, he wants to build. It's not just an autocracy, it's a civilizational project, and one that's been, you know, uh, very, very rigorously implemented. And the I would say the apotheosis of that was when the uh, Hagia Sophia was converted into a full-service mosque, and it was no accident that Erdogan's final campaign speech was delivered from the Hagia Sophia. Uh, I think he's been extremely successful at sort of leveraging Islam piety uh, and nationalism, to, you know, melding Turkish pride with piety to create, you know, a sort of feeling where 
the ordinary citizen says that, you know, uh, my country's security and my freedom to uh, worship is more important than being able to buy onions. Onions is, you know, onions are apparently very <laughs> expensive in Turkey. So that became a huge uh, campaign issue. Um, but I just wanted to say that and uh, please, and um, you respond. Mm. No, no, I was just going to say the same thing, actually, Amirin. I mean, um, he wants to, I think, consolidate and hegemonize and a sort of certain his certain view of a nationalist and religious Turkey, right? A Turkey that does grow in nationalism, but also on religiosity across society, through the education system, through everything, and which has implications, of course, for women's rights, children's rights, everything, what have you on society and I think uh, so that would so of course it hasn't been easy for the AKP to do that since the opposition is also quite strong the societal opposition is strong right maybe not the opposition parties per se or main opposition per se but the societal opposition is strong and that's why he's found it difficult to do so so I think he'll push for that uh, of course more forcefully in the next five years because now he has the power also to do so I guess he will be feeling a little bit more secure in power but also, I'd like to add something on this NATO and Russia issue, if I may, um, because, I mean, when we look at Turkey's relationship with the West or with European partners, we often tend to think, you know, in, you know, in view of what we used to think about a decade ago or so, that Turkey might have to soften up or make concessions to the West because it needs funds for its ailing economy. Yes, I agree with that. But... And this is why I want to go back to my discussion or to my point about the international order being in crisis. Now the order is a different one in the sense that you can turn to alternative sources of funding, right? Um, and, and Erdogan is quite good at playing that game. You know, it's a short-term game. It's not a long-term game. But, you know, for him, politics is a pragmatic short-term strategy of remaining in power. So he can turn to the Gulf countries. He can turn to Russia. He can turn to, you know, all kinds of autocracies around China, what have you. Now, and that brings me to the point you made about stability, because I think from a European perspective, what kind of perplexed me about that comfort zone with Erdogan kind of argument is that it's a very short term political thinking, right? Because I think what I would expect in the next five years is increased Russian involvement in Turkey, right? Um, that's my fear, personally, and that's what's coming. I mean, Russia now has a nuclear power plant in Turkey. Now, I'm not sure if this is actually received as such in Europe, right? So if Ukraine, if war, if security considerations are of any concern, I think the main thought is, well, Turkey will somehow continue to hedge. Well, yes, but then think about how Putin put his weight behind Erdogan to the extent that he delayed gas payments in the middle of the war, right? He was on Turkish national TV campaigning on his behalf. So, I mean, these all go to show that, you know, and since foreign policymaking in Turkey today is anything but transparent, it's very difficult to tell what the actual dealings between the two parties are. And that runs a risk. I think a major security risk for, bears a certain risk, security risk for NATO and the West as well, which mm -hmm. I'm not sure whether this is being discussed to the extent mm -hmm. that it should. And what if Trump comes to power? Yeah, yeah well, that's a, yeah. <coughs> yeah. That, that's, yeah. That's, yeah. I think that's enough. Just, just, <laughs> on, um, just one thing. Um, the security risk is very, very important. If Erdogan does promote, as you say, is Islam piety and the nationalist agenda and taking pride, wouldn't more Russian influence actually dent some of his definition of sovereignty? Not necessarily. Well, look, I mean, normally, if you go and look at Turkish history books, you would, we were raised, you know, with all this narrative about Russia being a perpetual enemy, right? Uh, always against Turkish national interests. They want to go into the warm waters, so they need the straits. They wanted to invade us, blah, blah, and all that, right? But look at the situation today, right? So Erdogan managed to put the narrative and also, you know, given the strongman position as such that anti-Westernism in Turkey is extremely high. 
um, and the government has been pushing an anti-Western narrative for the last decade or so. This anti-Westernism, this anti-Americanism is the bigger component of this, of course, and not so much Euroscepticism or anti-Europeanism, mm. right? So much so that Russia seems like a more or less justified actor, right? Mm. So you have to think of it in more nuanced terms, that this, to some extent, he can sell it to the public. That's what I'm trying to say. Mm-hmm. Mark, you wanted to jump in here. Yes, I think uh, Senemi is a bit too modest on the Russian influence in, in Turkey. Uh, I have uh, documented this since August 2016, when uh, Erdogan post-coup uh, uh, went to St. Petersburg. And I uh, produced a, a, a hypothesis, uh, which unfortunately for us has proven right, that uh, uh, Russia will play Turkey against NATO and against the EU. And this is what has happened. And it's uh, very transactional. It goes against history books, of course. Uh, but uh, in many ways, Putin has voted Erdogan with billions and billions, with missiles, of course, has frozen the NATO front over the Black Sea, if you look at it in retrospect, since the delivery of the S-400 missiles. Basically, you have none of the two most advanced uh, uh, military equipment of NATO operational on the interface with Russia, thanks to the deal with Erdogan. Uh, that's one. Then, uh, as Sinan, Sinan mentioned, uh, the uh, 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 gas payments uh, delayed and in rubles, the mm-hmm. advance payment on the Russia nuclear plant, and so on and so forth. And this will continue for a very simple reason, which is that uh, the Kremlin needs Turkey on its side. The, the war is a lot more, immensely more difficult uh, in Ukraine than what well, they thought. And they thought of destroying uh, uh, Ukraine. They thought of uh, delinking Ukraine from NATO. It's not happening, obviously. Uh, so uh, having a frozen NATO member on its southern flank is of paramount importance from, for the Kremlin. And then, of course, uh, helping Assad stay in power through some sort of reconciliation between Assad and Erdogan, that is also uh, something important for Russia because mm-hmm. in Russia, this is a client regime for the Kremlin. This is also the springboard for their operations in sub Saharan mm-hmm. Africa. Mm-hmm. But what the three of you are, are, did anybody want to jump in there? I just wanted to yeah, ask please, something on the question that yeah. you posed. And of course, the other um, sort of problem there is the succession issue because Erdogan is clearly, obviously, not in the best of health. And what we're witnessing is his him grooming his younger son-in-law uh, for the succession. All you need to do, I keep repeating this, is look at his his social media feed, the younger son-in-law, who, you know, is the brains behind that Bayraktar drones. Um, but, you know, will they be able to pull that off? I think, you know, that remains to be seen. Uh, I would, I'm sort of betting that he's going to, launch his career f- from Istanbul and make him the candidate for the uh, mayoral elections. Uh, so we need to watch that space too. Erdogan, you know, like all the rest of us, is human. And uh, as I said, his health, that's that's a sort of a risk factor also. Mm-hmm. Yes, but it is a, quite a phenomenon that uh, mortality it, it, it goes at snail's pace for some of these autocratic leaders, frankly. But um, I, I want to just, we don't have much time left. Um, I think it was Sinem that um, raised the issue, and this is just not about the, the Americans and the Europeans, you know, critical of Turkey. We have, we have the changing dynamics of geostrategic politics, the role of China, the role of Russia in the Black Sea area, the Ukraine war, the rehabilitation or reconciliation with Assad. We have all these areas of, of flux of instability and and um, unpredictability. And my question to the three of you is that, um, leaving aside how Erdogan has another five years, is there anything unpredictable now uh, about Turkey and its role with the Europeans or NATO in the Black Sea? I mean, is there anything unpredictable that will give some kind of movement for change? Well, Mark, would from, you like from, to jump in? Yeah, from from my point of view, 
here in Brussels, uh, the I wouldn't call it um, unpredictability, but I'd call it call it uh, expectation. It's one the uh, degree and speed uh, at which uh, the economic policy will be revised, because this is the the you know the the lung of uh, the EU Turkey economic relationship. That's one. Uh, so measures are expected on interest rates, on fiscal policy, and so on and so forth. Uh, but again, this goes together with a minimum, uh, a measure of improvement of, of mm -hmm. rule of law. Otherwise, it will not work. Uh, of course, you can play EU member states one against the other, and Orban mm -hmm. is is a good friend, but Orban, Orban is not going to save the mm -hmm. Turkish economy, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, well, but you have uh, Italy and Spain, Mm -hmm. uh, they are closer, they have uh, big investments. Okay, fine, but Spain is in a political crisis right now. Uh, so we'll, we'll see. The big names are, are obviously within the EU, Germany and France, and they will want, and, and the Netherlands, uh, in the case of Turkey, they will want to see uh, improvements. Uh, well, I think they have their hands full at the moment over, over, uh, over Ukraine and, and the deep sure. China. We have a question here, which I find um, uh, actually this one is NATO. The century of Turkey vision. I mean, I, I hate the word visions uh, because they conjure up all sorts of expectations, which Mark uh, um, raised. But the question here is any thoughts perhaps by the panel, keep it brief, please, on potential implications in relation to this? In some ways, you've answered it, given how, how Erdogan wants to use the power. But this vision... Um, and it's it's a very particular kind of modernization vision, isn't it? Which goes against the grain of what uh, we in Europe and and the United States would think of of modernization. What's it? Any ideas what this vision may amount to? I mean, I think we've discussed it at some length mm -hmm. you know, about. I mean, when we refer to um, nationalism, conservatism, yeah. religiosity. Um, a, a sort of a society also that kind of is transformed more along these lines where <coughs> these values are more and more consolidated, not at the top, but also at the mm -hmm. bottom. I think that's his vision. So in a way, sort of a, yeah. a, a change away from often the, when, when you look at AKP ideologues, they talk about yeah. the sort of the Republic as a 100 year parent thesis, right? And one mm -hmm. thing that something that needs to be closed. Of course, yeah. they have had to make their peace with Mustafa Kemal and because, of course, they embrace nationalism and they sort of adopt a certain version of Kemalism, which is not the standard version that we're used to. But so they don't they can't completely do away with him. But but what they can do away is the more sort of idealistic modernize, mm -hmm. modernization, westernization uh, project and sort of completely turn it around. I think that's what they mean by mm -hmm. so Vision. Thanks, thanks for this. Anyway, we've got just a couple of minutes left, and we have around the corner is the NATO summit in the Lithuanian capital of Vilnius, and we have Turkey still blocking uh, Sweden's uh, membership to NATO. Um, it's extraordinary one NATO country blocking another who wants to join, yeah, and it's, it's, it's sweet, yes, but um, oh, like Hungary. Well, Hungary is, is hiding behind um, uh, Turkey in some ways, Mark. But uh, what's your sense of this? Uh, will will Turkey um, lift its its veto? Um, Sweden says it's met most of the demands. What's what's your reading of this uh, now? Since we only have four weeks left, running up to the sure. five weeks left, running to the NATO summit. Well, this is typical bazaar diplomacy. Okay, you've given me this, but I still need a bit more. Okay, uh, it, it's uh, nice when you're buying carpets in the uh, um, Grand Bazaar in Istanbul, but uh, in foreign policy, it's a bit more difficult. Essentially, Sweden has given what they could, uh, giving more, that is, rendition of uh, 50 or 100 uh, citizens or, or foreigners with legal status. That is not going to happen. Uh, Sweden is already technically very closely integrated uh, with NATO, but it is now becoming a political problem. So what Turkey might obtain, might, uh, is uh, 
half of the deal on the F-16s uh, from the Biden administration, meaning the modernization kits for the current inventory of Turkish Air Force F-16. Not the new F-16, uh, but the modernization of the existing ones. Uh, that is perhaps what is going to happen. But mm -hmm. I don't exclude that it will last perhaps even longer than the Vilnius summit. Oh, well, this ties up very nicely, unfortunately, with the beginning of this discussion, which was um, um, not giving many grounds for optimism. And as you say, Mark, you know, he, he, will, he will up the stakes. And all of you said it's it's rather a depressing situation. I hope when we meet again, there may be some better news and maybe civil society may be reinvigorated. Maybe younger people will come through. I don't know. But in the meantime, I want to thank uh, this excellent um, panelist, Senum, thank you very much. Mark, thank you. And Amber, thank you very, very much for, for joining us and, and for the EU Engage team and Maltz Peters and everybody behind the scenes who we don't see. Thank you very, very much indeed. And of course, to our audience, participants and the questions. Look forward to meeting you again. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.